Hey everybody, hello Jake, hi David. Uh, we're just waiting for a few other folks to come on. Um, they may come on through the uh, through the um, uh, the session. We'll see, but um, I think I'm going to start so we can get ourselves uh, going. Hello, um, everybody who's on our attendees. We've got a whole bunch of new folks who've joined us um, for this special event, um, and it's a really it's a it's a two tier event in a sense. We we finished the formal part of our symposium um and we're now going into the fun part so well, this is um we're going to be announcing our prize winners for the um, trailblazer and for our annual um guggenheim uh awards for excellence in criminal justice reporting and after that we're going to have a about a half hour or 40 minutes or so of a round table which we usually do when we go live we have our live uh, conferences and symposia uh, at uh, John Jay on the campus. Uh, we usually have the folks who are selected um, fellows are literally around a round table to talk about their projects, talk a little bit about what they learned um, during the sessions, what ideas and story leads and they have or problems they have coming up with projects. And it's sort of a, a, a way for the um, uh, journalists and for our fellows to sort of break the ice and be part of the project and talk about what they feel particularly on the challenges of covering criminal justice. And uh, I, already I've seen uh, a lot of comments in our um, um, chat room from many of the journalists who have already been totally engaged with what we've been doing. Uh, they have their own ideas. So I'm sure that they'll have a lot to say uh, at the end of the session. And you know, to help us uh, and be part of our conversations um, uh, for the round table and you know, for our year, I'm especially honored really to talk a little bit about our Trailblazer uh, honoree this year. Um, we developed the, the Trailblazer Award a couple of years back. Um, our first honoree was David Simon from The Wire. And we wanted to find some way of honoring and recognizing somebody in the media business or media related field who'd really spent a career uh, pushing the envelope on criminal justice. Uh, the criminal justice debate didn't have to be a reformer, didn't have to be from one partisan idea or the other, but who who really sort of broke, um, uh, I guess, the normal lines and and got people thinking about um, areas about of criminal justice that most of the public wouldn't think of and wouldn't think about. So David Simon was obviously a, a key first choice. We used that. Uh, we had um, lots of other people. You look at our website, you'll see uh, some of the honorees we've had over the past several years who all sort of fit that category. Um, and for this year, it, it, it was hard. Uh, it, it was really an easy choice. It, it, I would say it's hard not to pick anyone other than David uh, Innocencio. I've been working with him for the last three or four years and running um, some of the, the commentaries that he's provided and writings of um, people associated with him in the uh, San Francisco Beat Within workshop. And the more I got to know what the Beat Within Workshop was all about, the more I was really impressed. Um, uh, prison writing is a special art. It's a special um, kind of writing. Uh, it goes back centuries, of course, people writing from prison. But in, our, in this case, in our, um, in our time, it often means people who have been otherwise marginalized uh, by the system, uh, by society, and who finally found a voice. And people who have those voices um, are in, are increasingly finding them um, and and making them more public. So the Beat Within is not the only um, source, the only channel for prison writers these days. The Marshall Project has a lot of folks writing from prison. We ourselves have had um, columnists who've written from prison. Uh, and uh, one of them, in fact, we actually did an anthology of his prison writers before he was released from Washington State. Um, Jeremiah Bourgeois, as some of you may know his name, he's on the front, the front of our website. Uh, he's been a wonderful writer. He's now, after uh, being paroled, he, he was serving life without parole uh, since he was a, a juvenile and has finally been released and he's now studying law in Washington State. So, and he was a wonderful writer. But, uh, but to talk about David in particular, um, his full bio is on our site, but I wanted to just talk a little bit about uh, David himself, who founded um, the Beat Within in 1996, I think, if I'm not, if I'm correct, uh, and he's been running yeah. it ever since. 
And it really was, he's been conducting weekly writers workshops and publishing the work of incarcerated or formerly incarcerated individuals uh, since then. And he's expanded to, I think over 25 juvenile halls in California and has been replicated around the country in Arizona, Alabama, Georgia, New Mexico, Louisiana, Montana, Texas, and a lot more besides. And we're not the first to honor him. Uh, he was one of 30 people honored in 2017 by Equal Voice News. Uh, he was uh, received the Cesar Chavez a Hero Award in 2016. So really, we're, we're, we're glad to join the crowd. In 2011, he was honored by the Society of Professional Journalists as well for his work. Um, and the trope that we'd like to do is have him speak a little bit about his work, about his vision, about why he does what he does. Uh, I've asked him to bring along a few of his associates, folks who've been in the workshop. Um, because of the tightness of our time, they won't be speaking uh, during this segment of the event, but they will join us for the roundtable and we'll hear their voices as well. So um, we actually have a, a physical award that we give uh, as a trailblazer. Uh, but obviously we can't give it physically now. We have to mail it to David. And I was hoping to get a picture of it. And I did have it somewhere on my computer, but I can't find it now. But it's very, take my word for it, it's an impressive, really lovely kind of award. David, you'll love to have it somewhere. <laughs> if you can find room for it somewhere in those walls behind you, <laughs> it'll, it'll be great. So David, I'm going to give you the, the mic um, and have you speak for about 15 minutes. And, you know, we might open it up for questions. And after that, we'll go to our uh, prize event. Uh, We'll award the, and uh, the winners of our um, uh, H.F. Guggenheim Excellence in Criminal Justice Journalism Awards. Then we'll go from there to the roundtable. So, David, over to you. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you all. What an honor to receive the 2022 Justice Trailblazer of the Year Award. I'm touched and humbled by this amazing recognition and acknowledgement of our work at the Be Within. Thank you again, Stephen, and all the Crime Report team for this incredible award. And the near, you say three or four years we've been connected, Stephen, but I think we've been, I mean, prior to that, I think we had a, a, a pretty long relationship as well. So I'm going to say almost 15 year history. But that long, well, I, I have a troubled relationship with time, so you might be right. <laughs> not, not a problem, which is, you know, which the crime report has given the be within plenty of exposure over the years and allowing our writers to go beyond what I created the be within. So as you can imagine, plenty of hard work has gone into the be within's 25 year plus history. Most of all, not all the writings I have shared with the Crime Report has been the heart, uh, most of all, if not all the writings I've shared with the Crime Report has been the heartfelt writings from those in the adult system. These writings were stemmed from the Be Within program we host in many juvenile hall settings, as Stephen shared, 25 juvenile hall settings, as well as our publication, which I am going to tap into and, uh, shortly. I realize not many of you know of the Beat Within, so I hope in the next few minutes I can capture the essence of this amazing one-of-a-kind program that has touched so many lives, free and incarcerated over the years. I, I would like to start this off, if you don't mind, by reading a piece by an amazing man, writer, teacher, who goes by the name Z. Z has been in the adult system for well over a decade now. He, was, he as well was a juvenile who was sentenced to over 100 years to life with no date in sight. And uh, last year we celebrated our 25th year anniversary. And I asked him on the eve of our putting out our 25th anniversary issue, if he could write a piece about why he writes. And, and if you allow me to indulge you for a couple minutes, this was his response. <clears throat> I write because I have to, there's really no option. It is either this or one long silent numb existence spent waiting in line to cash my ticket for death. When I wake up in the morning, I do not feel like waking up, do not feel like wanting to be alive. Every night in my dreams, I am free for a few hours of troubled sleep, only to awaken to a cold concrete cement box and re-realizing re every morning that I'm trapped. Wish that I could give you some fancy noble reason for why I write, like because it might make a difference in a world that is indifferent to me, or because I want to spread hope and fight back against the forces that keeps us shackled and imprisoned within society and prison. And maybe those reasons are partly true as well. But at the heart of it, one tired, broken heart, I write for survival so that the heart can keep breathing. Writing about seeing someone get butchered to death will not make that person's blood pour itself back into his body and the holes close up like footprints the ocean washed away. Writing about my homeboy Trips getting shot to death as he hid under a car will not bring him back to life and heal the scar it left in the minds of all who loved him. 
My rough childhood, riots, struggles, deaths, none of it will ever disappear. Seeing the shocked, anguished faces of my young brother and sister as I heard the judge read off, read off my 137 year to life sentence as if he were simply reading off bingo numbers. No words will ever describe the helpless trauma in their eyes, nor make it go away. They stopped talking to me years ago, and no, writing, didn't, writing them didn't help. Nine years ago, I found myself with a shoe term, isolated, suffocating in the hole and wondering how I'm going to survive through all of this. I'd wake up and realize that my fists are clenched. Memories of life and of people I love tortured me day and night, and I had to forget them to not feel the pain. A deep hollow tightness pressed against my chest, and I'd have to remember to breathe. Oxygen is as vital as the water into the body, and writing became a way to and writing became a way for my soul to breathe as I began keeping a journal. No, it didn't fix everything. Didn't do much, actually, not right away at least, but it was a place where I could channel the craziness in my head, the pain and rage flowing into a pond that reflected an image of myself that I had never seen before. Not only did I begin to see myself, but also the world, almost like looking into a crystal ball when I gazed into my private writings. And so I guess writing helped me grow and evolve, forced me to see myself clearly and recognize that I had serious problems I needed to address. It opened up a window where I could begin to see outside the cage into a world I had been mostly ignorant to during my wild street days. My own ideas of the world began to take form and it made me hungry for more knowledge, for understanding of why. I am here, why all of us are here, why we are given crazy sentences and why so many of us are trapped in poor ghettos and why the police wage war against us and why we kill each other while the rich get richer and rule the world. There is no noble reason for why I write. I write for myself so that my soul can gasp for desperate breaths as I'm suffocated with metal and cement. Sometimes I don't feel like writing anything and that's when I'm not doing good at all. Floating through the days with hopeless hope, but eventually, the pressure breaks through like the sun after a storm and writing shines a light on the darkness. I write to keep some hope alive, as fragile as it may be, to share a message to anyone who cares to listen, and mostly for myself, because without it, I'd be mute and blind, just a body stored in the morgue for the living where writing gives life. Let's sit with that for a second. Thank you, Z. I know for Z, he'll be quite honored to know that I, you all allowed me to share that piece with him, with you all. The power of writing. Everybody I work with, if it's in our work, weekly workshops in juvenile hall or those I have never met, have various reasons as to why they write. As I know my colleagues who are out there in the audience somewhere, who are here, you know, hopefully will share in the round table portion of the event or the Q&A will uh, validate what writing has meant to them during their times of incarceration. Now, before I get a little deeper into the beat, I want to extend thank yous. Yes, thank yous to the following folks who I believe if it wasn't for them, there'd be no beat within today. First and, for, first and foremost, my mom and dad, a big shout out to my parents, David and Carol for their love and support as they've always encouraged me to follow my heart as I embrace my career. To my daughter, Liberty, who, been in, who has been an inspiration in my life for the last 22 years and I'm incredibly proud of her as well. To Lisa Levice, who is not only my right-hand longtime colleague and program director of The Beat, but she's also the love of my life, my wife. Did I say that right? I feel like I'm mumbling, but yes, the love of my life. Um, to Mary Nella Woods, who was the lead social worker in the San Francisco Public Defender's Office Juvenile Division in San Francisco when I got my start many, many years ago in the early 90s. She taught me how to advocate, empathize, and fight for our clients while learning how to write alternative sentencing proposals. She also introduced me to some of San Francisco's greatest, greatest youth advocates, such as Jack Jack Wild, the Omega Boys Club. I was always impressed with Jack's approach to the point where I wanted to model myself after his great work in the community. To this day, Jack, over 80 years of age, is still touching lives and making a difference. To Sandy Close, the former executive director of Pacific News Service, New America Media. She recognized me as a youth advocate and supported and warmly encouraged my efforts to bring the beat within the life. For nearly the first 15 years of, my exi of our existence as a program, she supported and mentored the work. Then there's John Esterly of the Whitman Institute based in San Francisco. John has not only been a champion funder of our work, but he has been a great friend and mentor, always there when I needed advice or a shoulder. Thank you, John. 
I can't forget Michael Kroll. Michael has been with me since day one, a true friend, mentor, and colleague. I can't imagine doing the incredible work without him. Thank you, Michael. With that said, a big thanks to all my colleagues, friends, partners, and allies. Also a big thank you to the thousands upon thousands of writers and contributors who have embraced the beat within and have not only empowered themselves, but have given hope to our many, many readers, young and old, over the years. The nonprofit The Beat Within is a writing program predominantly for our youth, but over the years, the work has expanded to our adults in the San Francisco County Jail and inside San Quentin State Prison, where we formally partner with a group of juvenile lifers called KidCat. And that is not even counting the unsolicited submissions we receive each week from around the country, from level four prison yards to county jails to rehabs across the country. The Birth of the Beat, our first issue, was on the death of Tupac Shakur back in September of 1996. But here we are in March of 2022. That's many years, like I said, over a quarter century. Allow me now to share uh, our latest publications with you all, and I'll speak on that for a few moments. Uh, so let me pull this up and give you a snapshot of what the publication looks like, because I believe most of you out there have never seen this. And if you have, uh, bear with me. So this magazine comes out every other week. It's anywhere from 70 to 80 pages of writing and art from inside Juvenile Hall and beyond. And I say beyond, that's our county jail, that's our group homes, that's our state prison. The magazines look pretty much the same, but the artwork is always quite impressive to the eye. And those, these are our recent covers of the last three issues. Uh, inside is very text heavy and it's writing and art from, again, young people as young as 12 years old to as, you know, to, uh, to grown adults in, in their 60s, 70s, 80s, sharing their stories. For the most part, for 80% of the magazine is filled with juvenile writings. The back pages of each of, this of, each of these magazines are where we, uh, where we embrace the writings of our adults. And uh, they have become the backbone of our magazine, The Beat Within. And probably one of the most important reads for many of our readers if they're first timers in juvenile or the adults who are just looking for uh, inspiration and guidance and in, in, as, as we all are. I, I always see most of our writers and readers as incredible teachers. And uh, as I flip through this rather quickly, I hope you can get a sense of how much text is in this and how much work goes into this every two weeks. This magazine goes back to every young person and every writer and every subscriber that, uh, that is, you know, is on our mailing list. And as well as, like I said, the youth that, and, and adults that work with us in, in, in the, the various institutions that we visit. So I'm trying to flip quickly through this to get an idea in the back pages, again, are the beat without writings. And um, again, I guess it doesn't really give you much, do, do, uh, do much good because you can't really read these. But if you're interested, you know, feel free to reach out to me or reach out to Steven and I'm happy to mail you all a copy of the magazine so you can uh, get a snapshot, so you can have a copy and, uh, and learn more about the great work that uh, we've been doing for many, many years. Uh, our, like I said, our first workshop started in January of 1996 inside the San Francisco Juvenile Justice Center. From that point until September, we would show up or I would show up with some of my colleagues or guest speakers each week, rain or shine, to do some writing with the youth in detention. I'd have a guest speaker, we'd share food, we'd read and conversate. Some days worked out better than others, but we showed up. Though I never thought or imagined at that time we would have our own magazine. We didn't even have a name for ourselves. Maybe at the time it was called David's Program. I mean, I have no idea. I can't even remember. If anything was ever worthy to be published by these youth back in the day, we would reach out to the local papers or another partnering youth publication. It wasn't enough excitement for most of the youth to sustain a weekly writing program at the time. So we mixed it up, as I said, trial and error. I was learning as I went along. Fast forward to mid-September 1996, Tupac is murdered and I had the young people write for, uh, in the San Francisco Juvenile about what this rapper actor meant to them. I remember reading these heartfelt pieces and I was so moved and blown away by what they were by what they shared. I went back to my computer determined to type up all these pieces and share them with the, the uh, with the greater San Francisco population the following week. So I remember while doing that I remember discussing this with uh, Sandy Close, who, uh, who was just as moved as, as I was to get this writing back to the youth. And together, we also decided it would be great 
to create a weekly publication of writing and art from inside Juvenile Hall. Also in this very brief two minute conversation, we agreed to call the program I was doing each week and our new publication, The Beat Within. The Beat Within was born. For the next 15 years, we were just that, a weekly publication of writing and art from inside Juvenile Hall. Uh, the last 10 years plus, and up to this point, our 70, 80 page magazine now comes out every two weeks, as I just shared with you. Everyone gets a copy. When incarcerated, it's one of the most important reads, magazines on the unit in the hall. A few months later, 1997 rolls around and the beat's going pretty well. We get some press, word of mouth. We begin to expand our workshops to neighboring counties. Again, I'm based in San Francisco. So Alameda, Santa Cruz, Santa Clara, San Mateo, Marin. And here we are today, as Stephen shared, 25 counties later, leading close to 100 writing and conversation workshops a week. Now, the writings from our adults happened organically too. We pride ourselves on consistency, showing up each week, 50 weeks of programming and building trusting relationships with our young writers. So when a number of our standout writers were moving on from juvenile hall to group homes, boot camps, rehabs, youth prison, and the adult system, I didn't want the young people to think their connection with us was only when they were in juvenile. So I decided to spend my free time encouraging these former juvenile hall participants to stay in touch. So I began writing personal letters. I began writing more personal letters than I could ever imagine and encouraging the youth to write me once they settled in. Every free moment was writing a letter and encouraging the writers to stay telling their story to help the next generation of writers. And that they did. This soon gave birth to what we call our BWO, Beat Without Writers, our adult writers. And every beat issue to this day captures 10,000 to 20,000 words of writing from our elders. And as I mentioned, it has become the backbone of our publication. And of course, one of our most popular read, reads. These elders may be alumni to our juvenile hall workshops, are folks who have simply stumbled upon our publication and find inspiration to share their art. I believe most of the writers who write for the beat within are invested in bettering their own lives, yet at the same time are determined to save a life from falling further into the criminal justice system and or what to expect if it's too late. To this day, the, the beat within receives anywhere from 100 to several hundred unsolicited letters a month from our elders eager to connect and be a part of our platform. It's very challenging to keep up with the demand of these submissions. These writers talk about remorse, turning their lives around, finding their higher power, the importance of education, or sharing their story of who they once were and who they are today. Sharing their struggles and challenges, these writers are truly inspirational leaders and teachers as they come from the heart. Speaking of, our readership of the magazine is the youth in the various detention facilities we visit, the adults who reach out to us from around the USA, various community activists, teachers, librarians, middle schools, high schools, and colleges, and subscribers in the know, which could be you as well. The magazine is used in various ways to connect and understand our writers, as well as it becoming a part of one's curriculum for, at some school sites. The Be Within is truly an anchor and lifeline for many of our readers, as young as 12, as I mentioned, to as old as someone in their 70s or 80s. The magazine is truly a history book of the week. Our writers are giving us their truths and insights as they see fit at this time. It is, it is also seen as a resource guide because who knows what's broken better than those unfortunately living within the system and in their communities. Our writers courageously tell us their stories, successes, hopes, dreams, fears, losses, and concerns as they reflect on their lives, their current state and the future. With that said, I think I've shared as much as I can about the Be Within and the time allowed. I can't thank Stephen Handelman enough and the Crime Report for this amazing recognition and award. Again, I was incredibly touched the other day when Stephen reached out to me with this wonderful news. As I mentioned, it's been a lot of hard work over the years to create this amazing publication, to do, do these amazing workshops, but we have stayed true to our mission since day one, giving voice to our young and old inside the criminal justice system. We look forward to building and sustaining this amazing partnership with the Crime Report and any of you out there, feel free to reach out.
again, I'm open to any questions you may have for me. And uh, again, thank you, Stephen, and thank you, the Crown Report, for this incredible award. So we don't have time for a lot of questions, but um, yes, I, applause is all over the system. So even though we can't see you, virtual applause to you in particular. Um, but you're speaking to a group of journalists, um, and I'm wondering what you think journalists can learn from people who are writing from prison. It's two different channels, two different forms of media coming from very, very different worlds. But what can be the relationship between the two? What can we learn from these folks that are writing from prison? Wow. I mean... We, I mean, it's in such a, it's so important, as I mentioned, to give our, our give our writers a voice and give them a platform to tell their story. Everybody's story matters, as you know, Stephen. Everybody is a storyteller, and and each story has its own unique kind of journey, and each chapter is so different. So to allow a platform for our elders or our writers to write and 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 express their story, it's. We're, we're going to gain so much insight from who they are, what they're up against, and what their intentions are through their writing. And I believe that uh, what we've been able to channel through the Be Within is that these writers, ex ex again, want to embrace the opportunity to give back. They want to turn, they, they want to have a better, they want a better future for all of us, let alone themselves. And they want to show that there's more to their story than the number that was placed on them at the time of their sentence, mm. at the time they entered the system. I know what we've gotten, certainly from you guys, especially during the pandemic, that we've gotten a view of what life has been like inside facilities around the country that uh, we couldn't have got anywhere else. Um, but I wonder, uh, it's not easy to write from prison. There's lots of bureaucratic hassles, um, there's censorship, there's all sorts of issues that get mm -hmm. in the way. So maybe talk a little bit about that and, and about the problems there are <laughs> that exist and how you overcome them. Wow. Obviously, people who are outside, who come outside who are yeah. post-incarceration don't have that problem, but yeah. people who are inside... Well I, well, I hope at the round table, some of my colleagues will chime in on this. I like to think I've been incredibly fortunate in, in regards to the censorship piece. I mean, I am, I'm, I'm a guest of the system as well, Stephen. So I'm not going to just put anything out there for, that anyone gives me to publish in our publication, let alone the world to read. So I have to be respectful to the institutions that I'm going into as well. So what I'm looking for in our writers is someone who is, you know, ha, who is invested in, you know, in, in, in making one's life better, let alone theirs. And I receive, I, I, like I said, I receive hundreds of pieces. And for the most part, I, I think 90% of those pieces have the most, have incredibly good intentions of wanting to give back and show another light of who they are besides the man or woman that came into the, came into prison. Uh, but I do hope my colleagues will chime in in regards to the censorship piece. I have not experienced that even in my workshops, even in my in-person workshops inside San Quentin State Prison. I've been able to, uh, you know, work, you know, hand in hand, up close and personal with many, many students, writers who have shared incredible pieces. And then I've never been told to take that piece down or to be careful what I'm, I'm sharing. I think we all, all the intentions, like I said, have always been in, in good faith and in, 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 in and in a positive effort to make a difference. Thank you. Um, maybe a last question here, unless somebody wants to, let me, let me just check our Q&A and see if anyone has to. Uh, it's a question from someone, um, um, Seymour, who says, who asked you actually the question I was just going to ask you is, can you speak to one of the largest challenges, either institutionally or with your contributors, in setting up a workshop inside of a detention facility and how you were able to overcome the issue? And another question, on top of that one uh, is, do you work with women's prisons? Which is another question I had. So you can answer both of them. Yes. So when we're talking, we're talking about prisons and not juvenile halls. So I mean, they, they're each, each institution, all these institutions are challenging. But I have to say, San Francisco was a mothership, the juvenile hall. They they saw my work as a youth advocate and 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 respected my work in the community. So when I went to juvenile hall to say I wanted to start these workshops, they didn't ask me for a curriculum. They didn't ask me for a budget. They asked me when did I want to start. 
So I started with, like I said, trial and error. So that's San Francisco. Word got out to the other neighboring juvenile halls. And again, I've worked with each institution to, in, in the best way I can to make sure that they are comfortable with this partnership, being totally transparent from day one about what our mission is, what we entail, what we in, in, intend to do, and, and, and build and being, again, like making each institution feel in ownership of this work. When I went into San Quentin State Prison over seven years ago, I was invited by the juvenile lifers group KidCat and their support was overwhelming, was an overwhelming kind of uh, uh, like a, a, an amazing support. I've, I just felt the love and, and connection to this amazing organization that was working inside this, this uh, these, these juvenile lifers who embraced this uh, this opportunity, and we've we've had this amazing uh, partnership for, like I said, nearly seven years, minus the two years due to COVID. But we're going back in this coming month, so we're quite excited about our return to um, San Quentin. As for working with uh, uh, women, I mean, I would love to, and I think there's a place for us. The challenge is again, we're a small nonprofit; we don't make a lot of money. And that, that costs money to travel, it costs money to get into, I mean, it takes, and it takes a lot of time to get into, let's say, Chowchilla, which is in the middle of California. But I would welcome that. We get plenty of writings from women. Our latest issue has a, a number of pieces from uh, some incredibly gifted writers in the, in, in, in the adult system that are women who are talking, who are speaking about some serious issues in regards to their own uh, recovery and the challenges of what it is to be a, a woman spending the rest, spending life in prison. So thank you, David. Um, last question. Next 25 years, what's your plan? <laughs> Next 25 years, that means I'll be in my 80s too when I uh, <laughs> finish this work. Uh, uh, I love the beat and I love staying true to this work, Stephen. And, but it, it, it's, been, it's been an incredible gift to me. It's been a credit. It's it's been a love for me. I love this work. I I I enjoy it from since the day I started it. I've learned so much from the writers. If they're, it's a teenager or or an elder, uh, I I I hope I hope the beat will go on until as the kids used to say until the wheels fall off. Uh, <laughs> I see the program. You know, hopefully, I hope they hand it down to somebody one day when the time is right. Because I mean, as long as there's people incarcerated, their stories need to be told, and I think their stories need to be, need to be told more so now than ever before. And uh, I'm grateful that we have this small platform to be within to give voice and to learn from these incredible, gifted writers, teachers, young and old. So it's about this time when we uh, in the old days when we were all meeting together live that we would all raise a toast. Uh, to our winner, um, maybe have a few drinks. So let's do that virtually. Uh, coffee, water, whatever you've got, uh, or just thumbs up. So thank you, David. Good luck to you and best wishes for the next 25 years. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate you very much. And thank you thank all you. for attendance. So stay with us. So we want to move now into our, the next uh, stage, our presentation of the awards for the best uh, criminal journalism, uh, crime and justice writing. Uh, for the past year. You all know, I think um, this is probably the only award that's given specifically for criminal justice journalism in the country. Uh, it's one of the most prestigious awards, uh, journalism awards um, anywhere. Uh, our winners have gone on to win Pulitzers and many other prizes as well. Um, we're always glad to be the first to recognize them. Um, they're given in two um, categories. One, the best series, and the second one is the best single story. And we've, we've actually widened, we started out with just print journalism when we uh, began about 12, 13 years ago uh, with the support of the Harry Frank Guggenheim uh, Foundation. And obviously, as journalism has changed, we've changed. There's a lot more uh, multimedia work happening. There's podcasts, uh, there's even documentaries uh, that we want to recognize as well. But we, we sort of make it... Um, essential that whatever if there's something that's online or broadcast that it's we can also see the transcript online so our jurors can read it and be able to judge according to uh an, on some level of commonality uh between the different um uh um uh, entries basically um we also look for our jurors also look not only for the for for projects that win on the basis of good journalism but also on the on the basis of how impactful they were in their either their local community or the national community on criminal justice. So we asked the editors usually to give us 
with a, an accompanying letter telling us you know how effective or how impactful the different projects were some of these projects speak for themselves last year we honored uh, the anchorage daily news for an amazing project uh looking at um uh indigenous um non the uh, communities indigenous communities that had no police uh throughout alaska uh and it won many awards all around the country so really pleased to have them um this year uh in our series category uh the winners are jake bleberg and james mustian of associated press um accepting on their behalf the associated press will be jake bleberg or bleberg i don't know if i'm pronouncing it correctly jake you'll you you'll correct me but what uh, jake and um and jim did was they they did a series of articles under the headline of beatings buried videos and cover-ups at the louisiana state police which doesn't really tell you the whole of it um they found a pattern of violence and cover-up and cover-ups at the state police. They identified at least a dozen cases in which senior troopers or their bosses ignored or concealed evidence of beatings of motorists, most of them African-American. Um, the, the state police's own count was 67% of its use of force between 2017 and 2019 were against African-Americans. I'm going to see if I can share the screen with our, um, so you can actually see the story. Uh, and that may be easier said than done. Let me just see if I can. Uh, there you go. Hang on. So if you go down the, um, no, that didn't work. That's the um, actual prize winners. I'm going to find it and then I'll put it on the screen. But in the meantime, I wanted to give um, uh, Jake an opportunity to talk a little bit about the prize, uh, about what it took to uh, do the story and uh, um, whatever else he'd like to talk about in terms of what he's found. So Jake, uh, over to you. Th thank you very much, Stephen. Um, my colleague Jim and I are thrilled and honored to accept this uh, award on behalf of the Associated Press. and. Our, our deep thanks to John Jay College and the Harry and Frank Guggenheim uh, Foundation for this you know, prestigious recognition. It's really exciting to be here. Um, I wanna thank a few other people and then I wanna talk a little bit about our reporting and the importance of digging into injustice in places that often aren't the focus of world news. Um, first and foremost, my and Jim's deepest thanks goes to our sources, uh, those whose names appear in our stories and also those whose names we can't mention here. It's your courage in the face of intimidation and persistence in the face of obfuscation that have shown us the way. It is because of you all, most of all, that the world knows what it does about the Louisiana State Police. Without your relentless drive to expose the truth and see justice done, People wouldn't know uh, the name Ronald Green, who was a man uh, killed during an arrest with the Louisiana State Police. And um, if they did, they would probably only know the false story that the police told about him, that he was a black man who died in a car crash after a high-speed chase. What we actually found through uh, extensive reporting and body camera video is that he was badly beaten by officers and uh, shocked with tasers and uh, ultimately died after that, uh, a story the police did not tell. Uh, next, our thanks and appreciation go to our editor, James Martinez. Without James's unwavering support and tireless advocacy, this reporting just wouldn't have happened. James's guidance kept us on track as we raced around Louisiana. His bulletproofing, sometimes late into the night, kept our reporting fair and accurate. And his tightening, sharpening of our writing ensured that this story was told clearly and with force. James, you're an invaluable part of this team and deserve this recognition every bit as much as we do. Uh, we also want to thank our supervisors, Adam Causey and David Caruso, for freeing us up to pursue this reporting for many months. Um, our thanks also goes to a team of our colleagues, uh, reporters, producers, editors, photographers, and videographers. to name uh, all of your skill and Lee, uh, we want to thank the higher ups at the Associated Press, especially uh, Marjorie Miller, Brian Carvalano, and Julie Pace, our executive editor. Uh, you all invested AP's resources into hard, slow reporting 
in a corner of Northeast Louisiana that's far from the people and places that usually drive national news. For that, we're forever grateful because this reporting simply would not have been possible without a great deal of time on the ground in Louisiana. I wanna talk a little bit about that. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible without looking our sources in the eyes over coffee, getting to know people, without being handed documents in McDonald's parking lots, and without knocking on the doors of people who never wanted to hear from us. And a big part of that is because for every person who threatened us or slammed a door in our face during our reporting, we also met new people um, whose names we hadn't known before, people we only met because we were there uh, spending time in the place we were writing about, people with things they desperately wanted to share with the world, and people who were thrilled and probably hadn't seen for a long time a journalist who was asking questions about what was happening in their community and pressing to hold the people there accountable. Uh, Jim and I spent weeks reporting, especially in uh, Monroe, Louisiana, up in the Northeast and other places in the state, because the United States doesn't have a criminal justice system. It's got thousands of them spread out in every city and county and parish across the country. And you can't cover them all as one thing. Each of them is meting out its own form of justice and injustice. Um, so each time Jim and I left Monroe, we left with the stories that, you know, we ultimately submitted for this prize, but also more stories than we could possibly write. And we also left worried, um, worried that the pattern of violence and cover up that we found there wasn't something exceptional. We, we left afraid that in too many other, too little scrutinized corners of the United States, there are other deaths that uh, might have been blamed on a car crash when that wasn't the whole story. Um, so I'll close with a word of encouragement to our fellow journalists. And this is, you know, I think one of the most important lessons for me of this reporting, that when you get a tip about something wrong in some faraway place, go chase it down because there's a story there that needs telling. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jake. Again, a virtual applause to everyone, a virtual toast uh, to you and your team at AP. Uh, before we go on to the single story winners, I wanted to do a quick shout out uh, to our hardworking jurors. Uh, I'm not sure that they're um, on with us tonight, but I wanted to mention them by name because um, uh, they, you know, in order to, they've sifted through about 50 different entries um, over their two months through Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, and it was a really tough call. There were some fantastic um, entries uh, uh, from all over the country, uh, which is saying something about the quality of criminal justice journalism. Uh, whatever people may think about what journalism is up to these days, and obviously we're under more pressure and financial strain than we've ever been, uh, lots of layoffs. But besides that, and aside from that, or despite that, maybe whatever the word is, uh, there's been some excellent work being done, both in the larger mainstream media, as well as in the heartland, smaller papers, smaller operations, uh, smaller broadcast places. And we really want to salute them all by in, in um, uh, a ceremony like this. But uh, to our jurors, the jurors for the 2022 awards, reading them in alphabetical order were Alexa Capilotto, who teaches journalism at John Jay College and coordinates the college's uh, digital media and journalism minor. Uh, she was, uh, in a past life, she was enterprise editor at the San Diego Union Tribune. Uh, Joe Dominic, who is an award-winning investigative journalist and author and uh, adjunct lecturer in journalism at the U UCLA, uh, University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication. And he is also uh, an associate director of the Center of Media Crime and Justice. Uh, his most recent book was Blue, uh, the LAPD and the Battle to Redeem American Policing. He is a, one of the country's foremost experts on policing. Uh, Ted Guest, who is the president of the Criminal Justice Journalist, and he oversees the Daily News Digest, Crime and Justice News for the National Criminal Justice Association. Uh, Ted formerly worked for the U.S. News and World Report. Uh, Anne Charlotte Givens, who covers law enforcement at The Trace. Uh, she was an investigative producer at NBC New York, where she won several awards, um, including two New York Emmys. 
Uh, Kenny Gray, who's a contributing editor at the Crime Report, specializing in health and criminal justice news. She's a former reporter at Newsday, where she shared a Pulitzer surprise, and she now teaches journalism at the Hunter College Department of Film and Media and directs the NYU Urban Journalism Workshop in the Media. Uh, Mark Obi, who is <coughs> excuse me, who's a freelance journalist, a freelance journalist focusing on criminal justice, whose work has been published in the Atlantic, Trace, the New York Times, Slate, and elsewhere. He is a former executive editor of the American Lawyer, of Texas Lawyer, a magazine journalism professor at Syracuse. Uh, University's Newhouse School. Uh, he was a criminal justice specialist for the Solutions Journalism Network most recently, and he's also a contributing writer uh, to the Crime Report. Uh, we also uh, pick for our jurors the previous year's winners, two of the previous year's winner, winners, and this year we had, we're pleased to have Eric Usmanski, who's the Deputy Managing Editor, Eric Umanski, sorry, Deputy Managing Editor of ProPublica, where he has overseen two Pulitzer Prize winning projects. And he was a leader of the reporting team that won the 2021 John Jay uh, Journalism Prize in the series category. Um, and Anna Wolf, who was a co-winner of the, of the prize in the civil story category and is an investigative reporter at Mississippi Today. Um, and finally, and definitely not least, Ren Longno, who is, I don't think with us uh, today either, but she served as administrator of this year's awards as she has done uh, for the past uh, five years. So thanks to all of them uh, in, abs in, in absentia. I don't know if they're here. Uh, I don't think they are because I don't see them in the chat room, uh, but they may be, I may be wrong, but if they can hear me, I hope they hear my thanks as well for their really hard work. So I want to move to our winners in the single story category. And as you can see from the share screen, um, uh, the winners are Maribel Knight, from National Public Radio and Ken Armstrong of ProPublica, who share the award for their story called Black Children Jailed for a Crime That Doesn't Exist, uh, which was a searing, as the story says, behind the scenes look at um, uh, the juvenile justice system in Tennessee's Rutherford County. Um, they really exposed, uh, as their editor said, an ugly and unsettling culture in the juvenile justice system that really put children behind bars on often spurious charges. And again, looking to the impact of their work, um, among the many impacts of the work, 11 members of Congress have called on the Department of Justice to open a civil rights investigation. And I'm sure that they can tell us uh, a little bit more about what the impact was. Uh, accepting the award on behalf of um, uh, ProPublica and the National Public Radio uh, is Mariba Knight. Mirabel? Yes, hi. Thank you so much for, <clears throat> for this award. Yeah, I just want to thank um, John Jay, Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation for this award. It's such an honor. And I really want to thank my co-reporter, Ken Armstrong, uh, who saw and believed in the story from the very beginning. I am so thankful for his collaboration and for his efforts. And also our tireless editors, um, Emily Seiner at National Public Radio, Sarah Bluestein at uh, ProPublica, as well as Susan Carroll at ProPublica. Um, and yes, to our sources, you know, this was a story or is a story about children. And that carries with it its own set of challenges and care and the need for empathy. And I want to thank them so much as, you know, they revisited their trauma and their harrowing experiences at the hands of this really punitive system. And it was them who often put their names on lawsuits that really cracked open the door to this secretive system. I really wanna celebrate them. This, this really is for them because at the end of the day, the changes that have been made in this system, although there's, there's much ways to go, but the changes that have been made have been made by them, the kids. Uh, it wasn't the adults who stepped up, it was the children. And they knew right from wrong, and they put themselves on the line to let the world know and to file these lawsuits so that we as journalists could go in. Um, and then also to thank the lawyers who took these cases on and fought really difficult and ultimately, you know, in many ways beat a path to this story through this constellation of lawsuits that were filed. Um, but yeah, just, you know, the thing that I reflect on in this most of all 
is that this is a story about juvenile court. And essentially what that means is that Ken and I had to get inside what is a black box, you know, rules of confidentiality envelop juvenile justice. Uh, files are sealed, they're often expunged, access is restricted, uh, and the secrecy is supposed to protect children and let them move on, you know, without this forever uh, marring their, their record. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that the beneficiaries of that secrecy really too often become the adults uh, who misuse their authority. Um, their misconduct can be hidden away, uh, detailed in individual case files that the public rarely sees, if ever. Um, kids in jail can be deprived of medication without the public knowing. Kids can be placed in solitary confinement uh, without the public knowing. And so what was really challenging about this story, but also really rewarding, was being able to, to get inside this and to be able to crack the door open uh, and, and, and reveal this system and all of the people that made it run. Uh, and the other thing I just want to say is that this was a collaboration between a local newsroom and a national newsroom. I work at Nashville Public Radio, uh, and Ken works at ProPublica, and I just, it was such a great example of the power of local journalism and the power of collaboration. And I am just so thrilled uh, to accept the award, and um, I just want to thank you all so much for recognizing the work. You're very welcome, Erba. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations to you again. Virtual salute, virtual toast. Um, the close, we the, the the runners up is what we call them, and it's kind of hard to think of another word for people who just for entries that came in close, but just not close enough according to our jurors. Some of them, the, the, these were divided by as little as maybe one or two points among our jurors' votes. So we especially uh, want to recognize. Uh, the two um, uh, projects in the series and the single category that came very close uh, and deserve recognition, although they didn't win the actual full award, but will win a special certificate. Um, so first for the uh, series awards, uh, runners up this year were Suki Lewis of ProPublica uh, and Sanjay Dirk of National, Nashville Public Radio. Um, for their uh, uh, series of podcasts called On Our Watch, um, using records of internal investigations obtained by a California reporting project, which is a coalition of more than 40 California news organizations. Suki and Sanjay found that police were really held accountable for allegations of misconduct in the state. And their seven podcast episodes investigating police misconduct and excessive use of force expose how law enforcement violence, corruption, and accountability have been handled from the inside when the investigations were never expected to be public. So I'd like to ask um, Suki, who's here, to accept the award um, in the name of the uh, runners up uh, uh, for public radio and, and uh, the California Reporting Project. Hi, um, thank you all so much. Um, it's a really huge honor. Um, first of all, I just want to say we're from KQED. KQED, and... sorry. I, 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 I was thinking of National Public. My mistake yeah. is KQED. No worries. Um, and then, you know, as others have mentioned, this is really for the people who shared their stories with us. You know, the police officers, the police chiefs, the families, the people who were killed by police, the victims of police sexual assault. You know, often people that we talk to, were scared and hurt and had a lot of valid reasons that they might not want to speak out or talk to journalists, but they trusted us. And it's only because of that trust um, and their voices that we were able to take our listeners beyond the thousands and thousands of police documents that we obtained and into the lives that were lost to police violence, um, the people who are hurt by this system of internal affairs. You know, it promises accountability but it's actually weighed on the side of self-protection, protecting officers and their employers. And, you know, I hope that if journalists listen to this, you know, if you take anything away from it, um, it's the importance of transparency and the importance of our role in enforcing that transparency. Um, we got all these records thanks to a transparency law that went into effect in 2019 in California that let us see inside the completely secret world of police discipline for the first time. But 
I want to say that even now that fight is far from over. We're still involved in litigation to get access to public records that we asked for more than three years ago. Um, so it, it continues on and on. And, and many people beyond me are also involved in that fight, you know, our lawyers and our, our news partners across the state. Um, so thanks to, you know, John Jay uh, for this award. I'm really honored to receive this recognition along with my colleague and co-reporter Sandia Dirks and our whole KQED and NPR team who made this really, 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 really hard and challenging work possible. Um, we had to go through hundreds and hundreds of hours of audio tapes of police internal affairs interviews. We had to track down witnesses whose names had been redacted from records. Um, we had to then, you know, form this into something that was a story um, and that, that connected um, both with the importance of our investigative findings and the narrative that people expect when they're listening to a podcast. Um, and so I just want to call out some of the people who made it possible. Um, Ada, Adelina Lancianese, who really made the audio sing. Cynthia Batubiza and Nina Sparling, who fact check the heck out of it, uh, out of everything, and helped us get through the mountains of records. Um, Ho Jing Nan, who edited our data. Liana Simstrom, who kept us on task and on schedule. And huge, huge thanks. I can't even say how many thanks to our wonderful editors, Nicole Beamsterbor, Leela Day, and Alex Emsley, who stayed up late nights, worked weekends, um, working to make sure that this was a, a representation that was, that was true, that was balanced, um, that was narratively compelling, and um, was meaningful and had impact. Um, so thanks to them and to the many, many other people who listened along the way and gave feedback and supported this years long investigation. Thank you, Suki. Um, and finally, uh, the runners up in the single category, uh, there were three of them uh, in one project, Simon Weisselbaum, Sachi McClendon of the Marshall Project and Uriel Garcia of the Arizona Republic, um, who did uh, an impressive investigation of the U.S. Marshal Service. Um, I'll let um, Sachi McClendon tell you about it. He's accepting uh, the award on their behalf. Uh, their story, um, U.S. Marshals Act Like Local Police with More Violence and Less Accountability was published jointly by USA Today as well as the Arizona Republic. And it provided a rare glimpse of a federal agency that has received little public scrutiny. Um, so Sachi, do you want to say a few words about it? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm just realizing that in my that photo, it's, I'm wearing the exact same shirt, so I need more. <laughs> well, you have changed it, I suppose. Since <laughs> yeah, yeah, I haven't changed in two years. Um, but yeah, so uh, I'm I'm Sachi. I'm accepting this award uh, on behalf of you know the Marshall Project. But uh, you know, I was just one piece of this. Um, you know, Simone Weichelbaum, uh brought me on to this project. I was just freelancing for them and. And, and Uriel Garcia, you know, great reporter at the Arizona Republic. He's now at the Tribune, I believe. Um, and so I, I'm just over the moon about this. And I guess I'll just speak real briefly about the, the story real quick. Um, so we created this database of U.S. Marshals involved shooting between 2015 and 2020 uh, and found that they were shooting on average of 31 people a year. And I mean, that's a lot. Uh, even if you don't think that's a lot, while I question that line of thought, and that is some pushback we got from the agency, I mean, shouldn't there be an effort to reduce those numbers of shootings? Um, and, and, you know, as we kept reporting, we found that the marshals were being used in these task forces to help out local police departments or, or sheriff's departments or sheriff's offices with strained resources. Um, so the marshals would help arrest, you know, your common criminals, you could say. And before I started this project, uh, when I thought of the U.S. Marshals, I kind of pictured these federal agents going after, you know, the drug, drug kingpins um, or maybe illustrious career criminals, uh, you know, the worst of the worst, what have you. Uh, but after reporting out the story, you know, we found that they were being relied on to execute some, frankly, low-level arrests. Um, and I guess when we dug deeper, we just found the training of some of some of these officers that they were receiving was was less than adequate. 
to put it mildly. Um, and they were using some very risky arrest strategies, um, like like boxing and cars. I believe one of the anecdotes in our stories was was this task force officer shooting from his car into another vehicle. And you know there was this victim, Soraya Lane, seventeen year old, who just wasn't uh, you know being pursued in any which way. She just happened to be in the car, and I, incredibly tragic, and also just like. Just, it's just chaos uh, on, on the part of that task force officer, right? Um, and, and because these these officers have these this federal status, uh, it's hard to scrutinize their conduct and, and behavior, um, and they're kind of shielded by by DOJ. Um, you know, I, I believe we were told that no U.S. marshal, deputy marshal, had ever been prosecuted after a shooting, like ever. And I mean, this is one of the oldest agencies out there, federal agencies. Um, but they do need to be scrutinized uh, not just by reporters, but also by DOJ, but also us as reporters should do that. Um, and I think our story was just kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, and I imagine there's a lot more to dig into, uh, with that agency. Um, but yeah, I guess that that's all I got for y'all. Um, I, I want to thank uh, my editor, uh, Leslie Eaton at the Marshall Project. She was great. I was just freelancing for them. I'm now at a local paper in the Bronx. Um, but, uh, that she, she's so incredible. Um, and all the other reporters that worked on this project were frankly better reporters than I am. I'm a young journalist. So, uh, they're, they're just, they really helped me out on this. Um, but yeah, over the moon about this recognition and, uh, I, I couldn't be happier. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Sachi. So just in, if anyone's worried about the future of journalism, um, I think all they have to do is listen to our prize, prize winners work, read the prize winner's work, and know that there's a lot more stuff happening uh, out there that is really worth writing about and reporting about. Uh, and they serve as an inspiration, I think, um, to all of us. I think what we'd like to do now, as I promised, we're pretty much on schedule, which is great, um, is uh, turn this into kind of a round table. So imagine that we're sitting at John Jay at one of our larger rooms, actually around the table, which is not necessarily round, it's sort of oblong, and we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the challenges of covering criminal justice right now. Um, our, the theme uh, for our symposium this year, as those of you who were fellows uh, in the program know, was whether the reform movement that really sort of seemed to have legs over the last couple of years has suddenly stalled and run out of steam um, for a lot of reasons, uh, not least the pandemic, the, the paralysis brought on by the pandemic, the rising crime rate, which is, and and then the rhetoric, uh, mostly of fear, uh, that we're facing a new crime wave and is uh, turning people against a lot of the progressives, for lack of a better adjective, reformers uh, from um, change on a whole bunch of different levels, from reducing mass incarceration to changing the sentencing reform, uh, to bail reform, um, and to police reform. Uh, so we've been looking at that over the past two really intense days and heard some wonderful speakers. And I know that our um, fellows have been quite engaged uh, in, as they've seen from their questions. So what I wanted to do is sort of open it up to see what some of you folks have been thinking about, those of you who sat uh, and endured a lot of the sessions and any of the lessons that you've learned and how you might apply them to the projects you're planning uh, as a result of this um, symposium and then maybe go on from there to talk about things, difficulties in general of covering criminal justice in what is really a very polarized time. Um, so I'm gonna volunteer people unless anybody wants to raise their hand and speak, but I would like you to, uh, um, you can just check, click on raise your hand there and I will, I will uh, come to you. But I wanted to ask um, one of our newer fellows, um, uh, George Sheedy, who's, made, who's had a very interesting uh, bunch of interventions during the conference and maybe uh, turn it over to him uh, as a start uh, so george if you don't mind i think you're i think you're there um let me just find you in the uh, in our list there you are uh so hang on a second so i'm going to promote you to to panelists allow you to talk uh george if you don't mind um uh, tell us a little bit about what you feel about what you've heard today, and some of. The, I know you were very involved. You were hearing about the um, 
in our paddle on mental, mental illness and the justice system. So um, tell us a little bit about what you felt. All right. Hey. Hey, George. You can put your video on if you want us to see you, or if not, you can just leave it up. Uh, we can't hear you. Um, there you go. No. Uh, you may be out of communication. So. Oh, no, no, here I am. All right. There you go. Sorry. Hey, I wasn't George. expecting to be on camera. It took a second. I know you weren't. That's 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 my trick. Yeah. I just sort of pull people out of the, out of the crowd. Yeah, and you're the first too. one. Uh, so, uh, good conference. Uh, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, the uh, yeah, I uh, can be salty in comments, and for that, I um, uh, I'm not going to apologize exactly, but I uh, uh, but I, I want to make sure that it's it's all like with love in my heart. Um, there are a couple of things that I, I saw during the conference that I think were really interesting and probably need to be followed up on by me uh, sometime next week. Um, Joseph Richardson over in Prince George's County and the hospital-based violence intervention um, has tremendous relevance for what's going on in Atlanta. Uh, I'm in Atlanta and people are shooting each other a lot. And um, I started writing uh, uh, as a Substack guy. I also write for The Intercept. Um, looking very closely at what has been causing uh, the increase in violence here. And it's a whole bunch of different things. We touched on most of it. Um, but there's, uh, there's been a concerted effort to shift towards violent, violence reduction in a way that I haven't seen before. Uh, it's a political response that's interesting. Um, turns out that the fellow uh, in uh, Prince George's County, like he's got a budget of like $400,000 and has been able to get something out of it, they're ready to spend $70 million in Atlanta on this stuff. Um, and I'm not sure they know $70 million worth of stuff to spend it on. Um, so I gotta plan that, I better take a closer look. Have I lost you? Are you still there? And we lost you, lost contact with you. Yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm still here. I just, uh, I didn't. Uh, and we're having, we're having some audio problems. Um, I can hear you. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Let me go. Uh, just for, uh, we did lose you. Um, to um, Kevin Gentry. He's from the crew from the Beat Within. Uh, Kevin, um, you, you've heard some of the, the our journalist winners talk about their prize, and those and the work they did to get it. What's your impression? And tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I've been associated with Beat Within since 1996, I believe, late 1996, where um, I essentially wrote to the Beat Within, David Innocencio, uh, while on my bunk after reading an article that was republished in the San Francisco Chronicle, I think. And I was serving a life sentence. I was one of those kids, uh, juvenile lifers, convicted uh, as an adult. And... Uh, just starting to learn about myself, starting to um, starting to grow up. Uh, I was in my third year of incarceration in a maximum security place, and the be within. Um, uh, I hope this doesn't sound too too flowery over the top, but it, it gave me life. It gave me it gave me a, a sense of purpose, um, belonging, uh, the ability to be able to. Um, tell people like we've we've spoken a lot about being able to tell our stories. Um, that was immensely important to me because although I I put myself in the situation that I found myself in, um, I, I I had the I had a story nonetheless, and um, and I was living a, a an ever evolving story each and every day. Um, with this uh, new place I found myself in, which was uh, prison at, um, you know, at 17. So um, I love, I love the fact that you, um, your organization and all the, all the people involved in this are celebrating um, a wide variety of people who, 
who do this wonderful work in bringing um, transparency, hopefully, to <laughs> bringing, bringing news that isn't ordinarily uh, known about or heard or seen, um, bringing stories to the forefront. I, I love it. Um, and I thank you all for it. I mean, David uh, and the Be Within are near and dear to my heart. But I, I just love all this work that's being um, recognized here tonight. Thank you, Kevin. So it, it seems a bit logical to move to uh, Chandra Bazelko, who's one of our, our fellows this year, has been a fellow actually for in a couple of our conferences. Uh, Chandra was uh, formerly incarcerated herself, uh, writes columns about it and talks about it. So um, Chandra, what's the difference? What, what, what perspective um, has being incarcerated given you uh, when you write about uh, stories today? And you've done some really prize-winning work over the years. Uh, first of all, thanks, Stephen, for including me in the conversation and for that compliment. And I also want to say congratulations to all the award winners. I aspire to have that type of impact. Um, I think that there's an insider knowledge, right? There's something between the lines that someone who's incarcerated can see is if it's either uh, suspicious or there's more of a story there or it's something doesn't sound right. That's why I always recommend that people who cover prison issues, talk to someone who's formerly incarcerated and say, does this jive with what you know about how this works in a prison? And the, I would say nine times out of 10 people, the formerly incarcerated person will say, no, there's, it doesn't work like that. Uh, a big example was the story, I think it was at the end of 2019 or 2018. And it was about um, the people being fed people in prison being fed a special meal at Christmas and it was during a government shutdown and basically the guards were not being paid and they were getting a roast beef meal supposedly all the incarcerated people in federal prisons to celebrate um Christmas and it made the story made it sound like it was some kind of sumptuous meal really it's just two pieces of sandwich meat that they dip into some type of gravy it's not even an edible meal much less something luxurious or you know indulgent so those that reporter at the Washington Post, I wrote to him and said, you know, you didn't ask anybody about this because everyone would tell you that the roast beef is not what you're making it out to be. It's not some some wonderful meal. So I think that the, using people who are formerly incarcerated as a fact check is a really good idea. Um, I know that my stories that I wrote while I was inside and, and sent out and had published did affect uh, a couple of other reporters because they started to understand what exactly was happening inside the facility. So that would be my recommendation to all the other fellows and everyone here is that use uh, people who are formerly incarcerated as a resource because a lot of the stuff about um, reporting about prisons is not the full story. Thank you. Uh, I see two hands up and I'm trying to find them right now. Um, here we go, Kerry. Uh, Kerry, right over to you. Hello, Kerry. Hi. Uh, you're you're on mute, Kerry. So unmute yourself. There we go. All right, we're all set. And I was just want to talk about my experience with the Beat Within. And I was at San Quentin State Prison and I was doing a lengthy sentence, you know, and I know at that time my family had moved to Texas. I didn't have anyone in my life. And a friend of mine, he told me about an opportunity to write an op-ed with the San Francisco Chronicle through the Beat Within. And it was regarding uh, Proposition 47 and how it's negatively affects some people, right? And people don't like county prison terms and whatnot. And he told me about the opportunity. I wrote it. And my first time going down there was me handing in that piece to David. And he was at the doorway and he greeted me. And it ended up getting published. And it just, I know, as far as my life goes, and I dealt with a lot of substance abuse. I was in that jail. I've been in that jail like dozens of times. And it was like throughout my life, there was so much just hopelessness and recidivism. And when I'd written that, and I always knew I was a good writer back in school, like they told me I was like, like one of the best writers in my class. And I always knew I had that potential, but then when that happened, it just sparked something within me. And then since then I've had more writing published, I've had stuff set to beat within and other publications. And I know it's been a sense of community too, you know, and it's something I've never had before. And right now I got the most time I've ever had clean and sober. I have over six years, you know, I got out of prison last year and you know, like, I work, I have a good job, you know, like everything's been going well for me. 
And it just feels like I like the beat and my involvement has tied a lot of things together in my life, you know, just um, that sense of belonging. And to me, it's my love for writing, but then also my love for people to their love for me, because I think a lot of people get lost out there, whether it be in the system, especially, right? Because that's like, like, you feel like there's absolutely no love sometimes, you know, where you're just being punished. And then out here in the community too, you know, a lot of people on parole and they come back out here and it's hard to reintegrate and feel as though we're completely accepted. So it's just done amazing things for me in my life. And I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Carrie. I want to move to Sarah. Uh, Sarah, introduce you. Uh, you're also from Beat Within. We've got a lot of folks from Beat Within. At least you've got a sweatshirt. Are you Are you Sarah Lynch or? No, my name is Sarah Cummings. Hi, Sarah. I'm with the Beat Within. I'm 22 years old. I work for the Beat Within full time as a workshop facilitator, editor. Um, mm -hmm. I send out magazines. Essentially, anything that Lisa and David need, I try my best to be there. Um, I'm an alumni of the program, so I was in Juvenile Hall till I was 18. I graduated high school from Juvenile Hall. I aged out of the system. Um, after being in Juvenile Hall, to get on my feet, I was dancing, I was stripping, I was hustling, I was doing what I could to survive. Um, I met Lisa and David organically and um, now I have a home and a career with them uh, and they've just given me so much brought so much to my life but when I was um, when I was incarcerated I was dealing with a lot of trauma I had been sexually abused I had been sex trafficked and in the beat within I could write about my experiences I could write candidly about my story and they valued my story. And that was something that I hadn't experienced in the foster care system or with social workers or with police officers. I was off, often questioned. I was often invalidated for my experience. And with the beat, they showed me your words are worth being read and being seen and you're worthy of respect and your poetry is art. Um, so that launched me in my writing, and I wrote a book of poetry that I still have um, and continued to write even when I got out. And it gave me a way to express myself and understand my feelings and process my experiences. Um, another thing that's so impactful about the beat is we all talk about systematic oppression and how these systems impact certain communities. But with The Beat Within, you're hearing personal stories. The readers are hearing personal stories about how systems impact the outcome of people's lives. And that, to me, is some of the most important work because our stories are often silenced and there isn't really, a, there aren't many platforms. So, Programs like the Beat Within give platforms for us to be represented as human beings, holistic human beings. Um, and yeah, I, I love this work. The Beat Within also saved my life. Thank you, Sarah. We're amazing people. We're like a family and grateful to be here. I'd like to go to Tom McMorrow, who's one of our fellows. Tom, can you, um, can you, can't get you on the screen, but if you were allow you to talk and see if I can get you there, there you are. Tom, you're on the air. <laughs> you are muted, Tom, if you are, unless you can see yourself. Uh, for some reason, he's not on, but let me keep trying. Unmute. I clicked unmute. Ah, there you are. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. But the whole event was was really perfectly structured. Uh, it was like peeling away an onion. We went in with you know, questions about where does where do where do all these reforms stand, and then we we come out at the end with uh, uh, the beat within. I mean, you know, so it really was was beautiful. Um, you know, I was struck by something early that the, the, um, 
it's interesting because as journalists, we're in a funny position when you're reporting on crime. You know, it's it's like, are we are we establishing the perception that the public has of crime, or are we just reporting and that is creating the perception? Because I felt like some of the early panelists, and and they were wonderful. But but it felt like we needed to do more in terms of like the initial reporting. And, you know, frankly, with an initial report, if someone gets shot on Main Street, your job is to basically get the who, what, when, where, like now. And, and you know, you don't have time to get into the, now you would, the I think the point I would take from them, which I think we should all acknowledge is that going forward, as you develop the story, you know, after the arrest and whatever happens afterwards that you need to then delve and try to get to that why, you know, at the very end. Um, but, uh, but I mean, the, the, the event was just fabulous. I, I just, thank you. Thank you, Tom. I wanted to go to uh, Jerry Mitchell, uh, if Jerry is still there, uh, from Mississippi, who's a, um, a veteran of investigative reporting. And I wonder, uh, if he'd like to comment a little bit on any of the um, sessions that particularly stand out for him and that he hopes to use for his projects. Um, uh, Jerry, can you hear me? I'm promoting you up if you can uh, talk. Such is life in the fast lane. <laughs> You know, I'm trying to unmute you. Okay. All right. Let me keep moving, moving along because I see Jerry is there, but he's not on the system yet. No, he's there. You go. Okay, I'd like to move to Janae Williams from Oklahoma, if she can hear me. Oh, there she yes, is. I can, hear you. can you guys Hi, hear me? Yes, you're in. I'm driving, so I'm not going to turn my camera on, but... Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so both days of this have been... It's just kind of been amazing to me how directly everything that's been said ties into everything I'm seeing in Oklahoma. Um, I work for the Oklahoman, which is a USA Today network paper, and we've had a lot of focus recently on how we report on crime um, and changing the way that that's done, but all of this kind of brings that full circle in seeing the reforms that I've been writing about because people are really starting to actively pursue them here, but then we have some people you talked a lot about um some of the struggles and, and the struggles with that division that we see we've got people just during our recent mayoral election who um we're talking about how the crime rate has risen in oklahoma and it is in oklahoma city it's worse than it is in new york or chicago and saying things like that which does create that fear in people that only makes it harder for those reform movements to move forward. And so as I'm writing and meeting these people working on those reform projects, it's just really, I, I see it in their eyes when they're talking to me sometimes. You see that they're like, okay, how is this gonna get reported? And how is this gonna be covered? And um, watching in our system where there's just a constant struggle between the police and the jail system and all of these different moving pieces. For me, I only being about a year into my career, it has been a crazy ride just trying to keep everything straight and cover it in a way that I feel like, like honors those voices that don't often. I wanted to ask you whether form. I wanted to ask you whether you felt particularly under pressure because of the polarized uh, political climate. Are you are you feeling those those headwinds really in Oklahoma? Absolutely. So Oklahoma is about as red of a red state as you can find. Um, 77 counties and in those counties, uh, all 77 went red in the last uh, elections. So uh, we don't have a lot of 
diversity when it comes to kind of the representation, even at the, the local and uh, state political levels. So the people that are there, we do see some bipartisan work being done. And I will give the people that are doing that work a lot of credit because I have met some of our Republican senators and House members who are actively working on some of those. Uh, like I, I mentioned that we've got some people working on some law and law enforcement assisted diversion and things like that. And we've got people really digging into that. So I'm thankful for that. But I do see people who have that tendency of criminalizing poverty and mental illness and substance abuse and things that are a more of it. And they're trying to treat the symptom by putting people in jail instead of actually treating the problems by investing into the things that would solve those problems. What, uh, are there any stories in particular that you're now identifying as, uh, as after hearing uh, the last day and a half that you want to get we want to get done? Maybe to change what you really plan, originally planned? Um, so there is a lot happening here and I'm thankful for that. And I think it just makes me want to dig even deeper and find some more sources that are more varied sources. Hearing, you know, conversations about people who, who were formerly incarcerated and, and knowing that I probably have some sources already who can get me in touch with those people. And then also just spending more time um, out in communities talking to the family members of the people that are being so affected by these things that are happening because those are the stories that like a lot of people have mentioned are so often untold and when people start to hear those stories they start to look at the situation a little bit differently I think. Okay moving north to uh, Chicago uh, Stephanie Casanova uh, you've been very engaged throughout the um, uh, symposium you guys Several interesting ideas and questions. Um, why don't you take the floor and tell us what you learned this year, this this week? Um, I think the biggest thing that uh, I found in my notes the last two days is just like a re-emphasizing that police are the easy source, but they shouldn't be the only source. Right? That's uh, that's it's so easy to just fall back on that. Um, I can't remember who was saying it, like with, with breaking news, when we report on, on something breaking and immediate, um, we just feel police said this. And uh, a lot, I think a lot of the discussions, uh, especially uh, early on, the, I think the first discussion on yesterday, uh, they talked about how police should not be our only source. Um, mm -hmm. And we should uh, try to, even on those breaking news stories, talk to violence interrupters, people on the ground, um, I got a few stories of uh, these two days. I thought it was great. Uh, and I'm also currently working on a story with a colleague. And it was interesting, some of the discussions we were having, uh, the story we're working on is about the juvenile justice system and some of kind of like the, the brain development of children and how that plays into uh, some of the decision-making that they might do and what, what kind of solutions exist in community versus um, in juvenile um, justice centers. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of what my colleague and I were talking about on the side uh, after I logged off of these meetings just kind of correlated perfectly with, with how we look at reform and what works and what doesn't and what the data says. So I, I took a lot away from it. Um, I think that'll help me continue to do the kind of stories I want to do here. Thank you, Stephanie. I want to move to uh, Michael Cabral from the Beat Within. Um, Michael, I'm promoting you. Michael is connecting. There he is. Yeah, hi. Um, no, I, I really uh, <laughs> just wanted to, to, to highlight again the Be Within. Sorry to keep circling back to that, but you know what? The Be Within, uh, so important. I, uh, I've, I've been out of prison for about 18 months now. I did 17 years on a 16-year-to-life sentence, which I committed. It was a sentence to when I was 17 years old. And um, I mean, there's, there's, I, I could absolutely echo what everybody else already said about the beat within, but one of the most important factors about it and what drew it to me initially, um, 
a story I always share with David uh, in Asensio is that my first three incar- days of incarceration were absolutely the hardest for me. Um, I was new to juvenile hall. I knew I was facing a life sentence. I was incarcerated for second degree murder. And I spent those first three days just in complete fear and shame and confusion and just crying and bawling and bawling. Well, after three days of this, I finally decided that, you know what, I need, I need, a, I need a new start. I can't just live my entire life and definitely not the rest of my life crying and bawling. So um, the first step of this new phase of my life to me was flipping my matrix. I figured if I'm gonna start a new life, I'm gonna sleep on a new side of the mattress. And in flipping that mattress, I found an old weathered, just tattered um, copy of the Beat Within magazine. Mm. And in finding it, I was able to flip through it and read uh, just however many stories of kids who not only were going through what I was going through um, that day, but who had been through what I had been through up until that point. And what made it so important was that, you know, I grew up a dysfunctional home, uh, sexually abused, violently abused. Uh, I grew up also in gangs. I was, uh, I, yeah, a gang member for, for many years. And I never felt connected to anybody. So I always say that that first edition of The Beat Within that I read was the very first time, probably in my entire life, that I felt like I was a part of the world. And it felt huge to me. And it made me feel important. And so I, I spent um, the next now almost 20 years in communication with The Beat Within and in complete gratitude of what they of what they have to offer. I mean, yeah, I was able to learn a lot about myself, but it made me a part of something. So I think, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong. I think we ran a piece by you um, uh, in the in the crime report. If I, if I remember correctly, I'm not sure. But I'm uh, yeah. But I'm just I'm wondering your experience as a writer. You didn't. You're not a professional writer. You didn't start out as a writer. Mm-hmm. Correct. Uh, so h- how has that helped you develop? I mean, have you learned a bit more? Is, is it something that you feel? Just expressing what you feel, has that changed your life in any way? I mean, most of us who haven't been in prison, um, uh, who haven't been inmates, we write because we cover criminal justice or justice issues. Uh, and we think of it totally differently from how you think of it, what writing does for us. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, uh, after I spent about a year in juvenile hall, you know, throughout the um, entire process of, of, of trial and then sentencing, and after that, when I was turned 18 years old, I, I was sent to the uh, adult system. And the first three years of my time in the adult system, because I was a little idiot, um, were all spent in the SHU, uh, the security housing unit. Uh, so basically in an isolation cell. And um, the cell itself was, 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 was miserable, but in picking up the pen, and writing these letters and, and, and then stories and sometimes poetry to the beat within, it, the cell provided me a safe enough place to actually sit down and be honest for the first time. Mm. And it was it, and, and it allowed me the, the first opportunity to um, admit how I was actually feeling. You know, outside of that cell, when I tell stories with people, it's 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 all to glorify everything that I had been through. And there was uh, quite a, quite quite a few uh, embellishments involved in all of these stories. You know, and maybe if I got into a fight, I I I would say I I whooped three guys, but when I was in that cell, I could say how scared I was leading up to a fight. I could say how alone I felt when it was time to run from the police, and all my homies went left when I had to turn right in an alleyway by myself or mm-hmm. or how 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 sad it made me feel you know every night watching my mom walk out the door knowing that when she came back if she came back she was going to be high or drunk and it was the first time that I could actually say that which which allowed me the first time uh you know to actually admit to myself and then to look back and to sit and study this that Man, I, I never was the angry kid that even I thought I was. Turns out I was a hurt kid. 
I was a lonely kid. I was a sad kid and I didn't know how to deal with it until I could actually say it. And the beat with it gave that to me. Thank you, Michael. I want to move to um, uh, Lissy uh, Beverage. Lissy, the floor I'm is here. yours. I'm here. Um, Hi, I think, um, you know, it was really a lot to take in over the last couple of days. And I, I kind of feel like I don't even know where to start, but, you know, like getting excited about so many different ideas and, and stuff. And I have, I mean, I do have a project that I want to focus on and that is, um, mostly like the prison conditions here in Mississippi and the legislation that, you know, they keep promising they're going to have some sort of prison reform and criminal justice reform here that keeps getting voted down. Um, and it's usually along party lines. So it's, it's kind of difficult. But, um, you know, a lot of the governor and a lot of the state lawmakers toward Parchman, which, you know, if, if you guys know, like Louisiana, it's kind of like Angola, the Angola of Mississippi. Um, so it's, it's pretty bad. And the conditions were so horrible. I mean, you know, some of the in, inmates are killing themselves. Um, we had a lot of prison riots in 2020. We've had a lot of inmate deaths that are that they're telling us are from natural causes and we're talking about people who are in their 20s and 30s who should not be in bad health and so you know I'm trying to kind of dig dig deeper we we had started a project when all the prison riots first started happening um so I'm trying to pick that pick that back up and try to finish that through so this stuff yeah. is really helpful i wanted to ask you a little bit i mean working out of mississippi or you know the southern states is a lot different from working from um, a huge newsroom in new york or chicago <laughs> uh, are you are you finding a little bit more pressure that you've got to cover everything and that the beat is almost you, you can't really concentrate on the beat that you want because you've got all sorts of other stories <laughs> that you've got to do is that um i, I well, hear that a lot Yes, yes. Right now, um, my official title is general assignment reporter. Right. I've been doing, I've been, you know, in the business for 25 years, and I kind of feel that's kind of like, you know, not really what I'd like to be doing. <laughs> but um, yeah, I kind of cover a lot of different things. But a lot of times, if I say I'm, I need time to work on this or that, you know, I'm, I'm given the time to do it. So that, mm -hmm. that helps. Does anybody else want to share that, the experiences they have, you know, in smaller newsrooms with trying to stay on the beat instead of just covering what the local Chamber of Commerce or the City Council is doing? Not that there's anything wrong with covering City Council, but um, it, it adds a bit of extra pressure. So anybody who has some thoughts on that and the difficulty of doing both, I'd love to hear from. Um, just raise your hand. Um, we can talk to that. Yes. Who wants, who's that? Is that George? No. I can't see whoever it was that wanted to talk to it, but whoever it is, go ahead and talk. Well, I uh, this is Tom McMurray. Oh, Tom, there you are. Yes. I, yeah, I mean, it is, um, you know, that, that pressure of having to cover uh, government, having to cover, you know, the different aspects. And, and you know, to me, my, my real focus is the criminal justice, or as it was called yesterday, uh, uh, the criminal justice non-system as opposed to a system. Um, uh, but you do have to scramble. You do have to, and so you have to carp, uh, uh, compartmentalize uh, the different stories. And uh, I think it just makes you a better writer because you constantly have to be composing and thinking and, and be one step ahead. But always having those, you know, if there's an arraignment, if there's a court appearance, uh, having those dates in mind and making that other stuff work, uh, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Anybody else have similar similar issues? <laughs> you definitely have to be very organized. <laughs> and persuasive, I imagine. <laughs> 
Yeah, and that's not always worked. And you know, the the um, FOI laws in Mississippi are completely horrible. I mean, it's almost impossible to get things that you want because right. the the penalties are are virtually nothing. I mean, it's like if, if they find that you you know a, a government body is guilty, the fine is like one hundred dollars. So the, that's not a penalty, you know. They'll just pay it and just keep moving on. Right. And 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 it's not a legal body that that makes that determination. It's like an ethics commission. So. Yeah. So it's not even a matter of law. It's, it's a matter of whether they think it's in the public interest or not. But then again, you know, as we heard in the last panel uh, about the states and reform, um, you know, the states and local areas, municipal counties, municipalities, counties are really where the, the battle is being fought um, now about change. And, you know, those of you who are there have really a front row seat, whether you can have an effect or an impact, it's obviously not clear. But there's a lot more going on there than just covering uh, justice from the national stage. Um, uh, I mean, from what we're seeing, the kinds of stories we run in the crime report and um, uh, the stories that we see elsewhere, it seems to show that there's a lot going on. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to, wants to talk to that in particular um, about the importance of uh, rural and heartland journalism right now for learning more about um, criminal justice issues. Uh, you know, Maurice, I see you're on. So, um, uh, I, I, you know, the, the state level is where it happens because, you know, we're talking about the, the when you when you speak sort of of the criminal justice system, you're really talking about the state system. I mean, there is a federal system, but the vast majority of what happens is is on the state level, and every county has its own. Uh, and you know, we're talking about three thousand counties in this country. Um, uh, I think there's about 27 or 2,800 jurisdictions because some counties are together, are, are joined together in, in districts. But, you know, that's where, uh, you know, individual reforms have to happen. Um, you know, there was a talk today about 18,000 police departments. Um, and when you're talking about how reform comes to police departments, um, and they range in size from, you know, 10 officers or, or to, you know, thousands. Um, mm -hmm. The local reporting is, is <clears throat> in my opinion, um, and that's the, where the microscope should be. I agree. So that's uh, probably a good note to end on. Our program says we're going to end around now on 715. I don't want to keep you guys uh, longer than I promised. Um, but I first want to thank everybody, our fellows, uh, folks from The Beat Within, uh, for joining us uh, for this last event, which I think is pretty, in many ways, more interesting and more fun event, even than the, the, the rest of the seminar. We learned a lot from you guys about coverage and about issues that you're doing. Uh, and I, again, I want to wish a lot of luck to David uh, and his crew. I see there are a lot of other people in The Beat Within who didn't want to comment, but they're commenting in the chat room, which is great. Um, so we look forward to continuing uh, partnership with you guys. Um, and for the rest of you, uh, you're now officially fellows. Um, that, that includes the prize winners. You're part of our fellowship family at the Center on Media, Crime, and Justice. Um, so we will be watching you and your your uh, the stories that you're doing and hopefully running them and cross-posting them on our site. Um, uh, all of our uh, seminars and sessions uh, this week were recorded. Uh, but the um, videos probably won't be ready for another uh, week or two, and I'll let you know when they are ready. Um, and I'll be posting as well a lot of the handouts uh, and research projects that we that our speakers have talked about on on that site as well. So uh, you know, check back regularly to that website, to our conference page website, uh, to see what's there. Um, I will let you know periodically whether we have something new on it. Um, as we uh, build and populate more stuff on the site. But in the meantime, uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us uh, for this uh, 17th annual HF Guggenheim Symposium. I hope you learned a lot. I know I certainly did. And I hope you're inspired to write even better stories over the next year. Uh, and we'll look for them and stories that we hope will be candidates for next year's 
um, Harry, uh, uh, H.F. Guggenheim Prize for Excellence in Criminal Justice Reporting, series or project. So keep us in mind. In the meantime, for all the rest of you, go in peace. Um, we'll look for you next year and through the year. So thanks very much to all of you. Big salute. Again, we're all in virtual time. So if I had um, something liquid, imagine I do, I would <laughs> toast everybody with it. Um, even if we had rubber chicken, we could eat it. But anyway, thanks yeah. to all of you. And we'll close now um, and have a great, safe weekend. Cheers. Cheers to all. Salute. Cheers, David. Cheers, Kevin, Sarah, everybody <laughs> out there. Stephen, thank you. Cheers. Thank you, David. Yeah, be nice. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Happy Talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Great event, all. Thank you.